Hi everybody, my name is Bonisile and this is Footy Notes. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about the England game against uh, the Ukraine. England looks like they're going to bring it home. I don't want to jinx it, but it does look like this is as good a chance as any for them to bring it home. Um, you know, bring the cup to the home of football and and hopefully a lot, a lot of the suffering of so many decades for the English fans will come to an end. But I don't want to, you know, um, obviously forget about what they would like, what they are likely to face in the final. I'm sure if I'm English, I would want a a a, a Spanish win in the other semi-final because I think Italy would be a much tougher opponent um, than than Spain. However, let's talk about England's performance. Um, in in this game against Ukraine, you know they they had total dominance of the game. Basically, you know I know the the end of the game stats say that the possession was um, fifty one percent England, forty nine percent Ukraine. But the 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 chances for the quality of chances that Ukraine created. I mean they had a, an xG expected goal ratio of. Um, 0.26 to England's expected goal of just under 2, 2.0. It was 1.98 to be exact. Um, England created 12 chances to Ukraine's three. They had um, 10 shots total, um, in, you know, to Ukraine seven. But clearly, if the shots that they they had taken were um, 0.26 um, xG, they were low quality shots, so like shots that were speculative that you couldn't really. Um, be expected to score from um, but let's talk a little bit about what happened in this game England were I mean the overwhelming favorites to begin with and it was really really good for Gareth Southgate to not repeat a back three system um, to play against um, this this team this team from the Ukraine the the inclusion of a of a link player in Mason Mount I actually don't care who that player would have been but before um, the game started, I did a, a preview podcast where I was saying England need to start uh, embracing the the strength that they already have in their defense. Play back four with two with two sixes sitting in front of the and screening in front of the back four. That then would allow them to to play an extra player um, in the in the offensive qu- um, quartet. You know, if they were going with a four-two-three-one, in this in this game, that player was Mason Mount. It could have been Grealish. It could have even been Sancho with, you know, Saka who was injured in, on the day. But like, it could have been anybody um, in the hole. I think even Foden could have played in the hole. And then, and the, at, you know, because England seemingly have basically their back six and goalkeeper sorted out. Raheem Sterling is sorted out. Uh, Harry Kane is sorted out, right, in terms of starting positions. I think those are the names that pick themselves. Because that back four, Kyle Walker, Stones, Maguire, and Luke Shaw, good combination of um, capabilities, physical abilities, as well as, you know, the, the, the experience and the brains they have to, to play the game at the high level. Um, they've, they, are, they have winners in there. And then Pickford behind them is probably the weakest um link in that but even he is a good quality goalkeeper for the international football um, level that I've seen in these Euros so with that back six if you want to include the goalkeeper seven they are gonna have more than enough to beat most teams in the world on, on their day and then it's a case of who go who goes into those other two spots along with Harry Kane and Raheem Sterling when fit those two guys um, have shown again in, in this tournament why they are, you know, Southgate's go-to guys. I know Sterling started the tournament with a lot of people back in England um, questioning his inclusion um, in that starting eleven, and it turns out, you know, up until very late in the second round game against Germany, he was England's only goal scorer. Yes, he does a lot of things that frustrate you, that make you go well, from one moment screaming for fuck's sakes, you know, and then the next moment you're going fucking love you Raheem 
you know so he's a frustrating player but I think he's frustrating because he he tries things you know um, as an Arsenal fan myself I was kind of comparing him to to a player like Alexis Sanchez who, who does high risk high reward actions on the field you know uh, a lot of players are happy to pass it sideways and so they don't ever lose the ball but it's not players like that who win you the game right players like Raheem and, and Alexis back in those days are the players who win you the game it's the players who try to do something um, you know a little bit more risky and you know they're gonna lose the ball a lot more so his passing accuracy statistics are going to be horrible and he may lose the ball even just trying to dribble instead of like playing a pass because he has a different idea and so the inclusion of, of him in the team is, is always going to be the case, it seems, at the moment. Um, and then, you know, I'm sure Mount and, and, and Sancho could make an argument that they did well enough to start the next game. But those are probably the most two available spots. You know, England could go with the same starting 11 against the Denmark team that is, um, that is already overachieved. But... I do think um, the combination of um, Rice and Phillips is a good foundation because both of those boys can pass the ball. They're good athletes. They can they can run you know up and down with the best of them in midfield. And um, Kelvin Phillips especially has very good attacking instincts, so he can like um, help with the penetration. On the other hand, um, and then you know the, the inclusion of of a number ten also allowed England to string a little bit more um, combination plays compared to the game against Germany where, you know, the 3-4-3 three, three meant the, 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 the seven players in the, behind the front three were sometimes a little bit too, the distances were a little too great between um, Saka, Kane and Sterling, um, between each other, and then also the distances between them three and the, and the people behind them in midfield and the wingbacks were too, um, were too huge. And as a result, in that game against Germany especially, every time Saka or Sterling got the ball, they had two people next to them. They needed to beat a player or pass backwards um, in order to find the teammates. Um, so so the 4 2 three, one, I mean, I'm not married to the system, but what I liked what the system did for England is that it allowed them to, allow, to, to have one more or two more creative players um, in the team. You know, and then Raheem Sterling could even play as a second forward at times because then Mount and um, Sancho could could do a little bit more of the the you know carry a little bit more of the creative load for the team, and that allowed players like um, Luke Shaw to join, who actually ended up with two assists himself. Um, and you know, I know the goals from England came from from set pieces. Uh, I do think though. The, the, the quality of, of their game in open play, um, you know, was good. I mean, they got two goals from open play, which is more than all the other games that they've played before. And then they got two other goals, um, headers from set pieces. So, you know, I, I think there's a lot to, to be happy about in the way England played in this game. Um, Jaden Sancho's first start in the tournament was encouraging. Uh, I, I, I like the look of their back four. They're solid. They've been very stingy and... It's been hard to watch at times, but it's hard to hate a team that keeps clean sheets. It's really, really hard to hate a team that keeps clean sheets, especially when they have the lethal power and, and, and you know, destructive forwards they have going the other way. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm English right now, I'm feeling good about my chances of taking the whole thing, but for some bad luck, you know what I mean? Because things can happen, a red card or something unfortunate, but... Bar that, England should make it to the final, and they would be not underdogs. I don't. I wouldn't consider them underdogs against Italy, even though I think Italy are the maybe better team in terms of experience and um, and style of play and easy on the eye. But England, just like Italy, have been incredibly stubborn as a defensive unit. So you know, maybe Southgate gets his um, comeuppance. You know, from from having been you know on the on the losing end in 1996 in the semi-final shootout so you know let's see what happens but i really really am excited by what i'm seeing from this young english team and and if they continue with this group i mean this group could probably cause uh problems i know they still need to take care of this tournament but they could cause problems 
in World Cup 2022, and their and their age profile could probably mean they they will be playing in the U.S. in 2026 as well. So I'm excited to see what happens between England and Denmark. Um, it's hard to root against Denmark, so I won't. But I do think um, the English fans uh, are going to like their chances against against Denmark uh, in the semi-final to to make it through to the final. Um, so I'm going to stop that video here. I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say. Drop your comments uh, in the in the comment section below, and I will be chatting with you in the next video. Cheers.